Hi there, Sage Candidate of VO2 Max Productions here with another training talk. Today we're going to talk about altitude training, and uh, this is a question that was addressed a couple weeks back, so I'm finally getting to it. Again, I appreciate all the comments for uh, future training talk topics. I try to upload a new VO2 Max Productions video here every Thursday, so subscribe for the latest updates, and feel free to comment and vote for uh, topics that might interest you in the sport of distance running. But this topic uh, was brought up several comments actually over the past couple of weeks and it's more about he was asking about altitude training masks for people living at sea level and whether those are effective and what strategies you could use if you live at sea level like most of the US population and um, a lot of the world's population as well if you're not in the mountains uh, what you could do to, to cope kind of with high altitude races if you're doing something like uh, just for example races close to me Pikes Peak Marathon or the ascent where it goes up to 14,000 feet or you're doing Leadville where you're around 10,000 feet the whole time or any race basically over 4,000, 5,000 feet, uh, you're going to really feel the effects of altitude and it's going to really hurt your performance. And the first thing uh, that comes to mind um, with being at sea level is, yeah, it is a big disadvantage uh, from being at sea level and going up and it's, it's going to really suck, uh, basically. And Definitely for people like me who live, I don't live at a super high altitude, but I live at 5,200 feet here in Boulder, and I train up higher, uh, but I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, for me, it's a, a bigger advantage uh, to both train higher and lower. Obviously, uh, I'm a better adjusted to the altitude, maybe not as much as uh, some of the Sherpas that live in the Himalayas uh, who hike up Everest, but I, I'm more adjusted to the altitude. Um, obviously than someone coming from sea level. But on the flip side, also if I go down to race at sea level, like at the North Face 50 or some other race, even if it's a road race, um, I find that I could, all of a sudden I'm running a lot faster for the same heart rate, for the same effort. And that's kind of the advantage, I think, at least of, of altitude training. And there's been a lot of controversy between uh, what is, you know, what advantages there are exactly and how to simulate that. And that's what we're really gonna get into in the training talk today is uh, if you're at sea level, first of all, I'll say it's going to be hard. Um, unless you want to invest a lot in an altitude tent or an altitude mask with an actual, um, with an actual pump, uh, a tube altitude mask that comes out into a pump, uh, the other products on the market, like the, the less expensive altitude training, altitude training masks, I should say, um, they usually see them, they're less than a hundred bucks. It's more like the power lung type of thing. Uh, it's a mask that you put on your face and a lot of pro athletes will endorse it. Uh, but what it really is, is it's just really a resistance type of thing, apparatus. Um, it makes it so that it's harder to breathe and uh, there's different resistance valves coming out of it basically that to simulate how, how hard you have to work uh, if you were at 10,000 feet, say for example. but. What it's really targeting is, or uh, what they're really looking for usually with increases in those studies, uh, is just basically strengthening the muscles in your diaphragm and making it so you could breathe, you're, you have a stronger diaphragm. It, do, it definitely increases uh, diaphragm strength and the, able to, the ability to breathe, but in actually changing, <clears throat> I need a drink of beer. And actually changing uh, your VO2 max or having some real measurable advantages, uh, it's kind of up in the air. It's kind of, uh, they, they'll say, oh, well, look at this peak flow, which the peak flow is basically when you <sighs> blow out as hard as you can. Maybe you could, ex you could, you know, exhale more forcefully because you have a stronger diaphragm, but in actually changing uh, significant things for endurance running performance or even performance at a, a one mile test or a 5K, it's pretty negligible and it may be even more of a placebo effect. Uh, so those are the one products, altitude masks. And yeah, they're, they're less expensive, so it's a good alternative uh, for strengthening your diaphragm, but that's gonna be pretty much about it. And then uh, the next level up though is we're looking at products. Uh, I just know off the top of my head, Hypoxico, and I'm not sponsored by them at all. 
Um, I will say that full disclaimer. Uh, that's just a, a popular brand and they make altitude tents, but they also make altitude masks. And uh, these masks are actually have a tube coming out of them and you actually hook them up to a machine. It's their altitude pump. It's the same kind of machine uh, that hooks up to their whole altitude tent chambers, their whole, uh, it's like being, you know, boy in the bubble type of apparatus, maybe it goes around your bed, uh, things like that. And these things simulate altitude a lot better, but they're still not simulating altitude. Now I'm going to get into this uh, in a bit here. It's not the same as, as actually camping, pitching a tent and camping up at 10,000 feet in Leadville. Um, and that's mainly because of the differences in pressure as you go up. And so what these pumps do, um, if, you're, if you're sleeping at high altitude uh, and elevation wise, you're actually sleeping at less air pressure. And if you're on top of a mountain, whether it's 8,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet, uh, it's not the fact that there's less oxygen in the air, it's there's, that there's less oxygen available. Uh, because there's less air pressure, the oxygen molecules are farther apart. So it's harder to breathe them all in because you got oxygen all scattered all about. Whereas down at sea level, uh, there's more pressure pushing the oxygen molecules closer together. So the difference uh, between these simulated tents and devices and pumps from Hypoxico and actually camping up high, living high, um, is that pressure difference. And instead, to make up for that, what uh, these pumps do is they actually just kind of dilute the amount of oxygen you could get and they replace that with nitrogen. So, which is fine to breathe, but it's not quite the same. Um, and I'm going to get into maybe the, the ramifications of or the, the things that that might uh, cause, I guess. Um, but it, it is, I looked at a lot of studies <laughs> to, to see this and there's a lot of variables at play. So it is a bit complicated. And so, um, yeah, with these masks, you could, you could actually exercise like on a treadmill or stationary bike at sea level and be breathing in this lower uh, oxygen content. And that's actually been shown to be a pretty good stimulus. And the other alternative would actually be going to altitude. So. You know, if you're at sea level, you got a high altitude race coming up, um, best thing to do is to get there like three weeks early, at least two weeks early to acclimate. Uh, next best thing, if you can't get there at least five days early, uh, you're a little more screwed, I guess. But uh, in that case, if you, you know, most people have to work and they can't travel to take that many days off and travel to a race that early. Uh, it'd be best to go last minute, maybe just within 24 hours of the start time. Because really, your second day, you know, at altitude is probably going to be the worst. Your body's really kind of going in shock, uh, trying to grab it um, adaptations, but it's not be able to ad adapt fast enough in two days. Uh, so it's better to be there either a lot longer of a time, preferably two to three weeks at least, or get there last minute and just go in and try to stay hydrated because that's going to crush you. Um, but in terms of training for these events, uh, we talked about the altitude mask and, uh, you know, personal story. Um, I know this guy, Eric Blake, a lot of you may know he's a mountain runner. He's also qualified for Olympic trials in the marathon. He ran 221. I think he still has the world record for a marathon treadmill, which I think was also 221. Uh, but he's won Mount Washington a couple times. He's gone sub 60 in that race, all uphill race which goes up to over 5,000 feet. So it's not super high altitude, but it's he lives in Connecticut at sea level and trains there. And he also won Pikes Peak Ascent uh, two years ago. And I think this year he ran about 213 there at the Pikes Peak Marathon, or Ascent Race here in Colorado, which goes up to 14,000 feet, uh, over 14,000 feet actually. But he told me that he actually does use the Hypoxico mask and what he does is he uses it when he's on a stationary bike and he uses it uh, doing hard workouts at sea level and so um, and this kind of core and he's obviously done very well at these high altitude races um, so whether or not it's actually changed his blood profile that much I don't know I didn't ask him for his blood test results but I've seen a guy that trains at sea level do very well at a race like Pikes Peak. And obviously having a good amount of residual fitness, being a, a, an elite athlete, definitely uh, you see some other athletes, uh, Cassie Inman, for example, trained in Vermont, she did very well at Pikes Peak. Um, and I don't think she used an altitude mask, but uh, individual variations aside, uh, basically to get yourself as fit as possible for a high altitude race is really the key. And training through heat and humidity. Uh, makes you tougher and makes you able to cope to things like the altitude. But what really is going to matter is your your training, 
uh, if this is if you can't get an altitude mask, it's really going to matter is optimizing your training uh, for the course, whether it's uphill running or technical trail or just being able to suffer more uh, through having a high lactate threshold and high VO2 max and ramping that up. And uh, I think that's really the key. But anyway, to get back to the scientific studies, um, what they found, and this is the same I think with Eric Blake, is that intermittent hypoxic training, intermittent I should say, um, is really a, a good way to go. Um, there's been studies where they had pools of athletes do the, the same thing Eric was doing basically, where uh, a mask hooked up to a hypoxico generator and have it simulate high altitude, but they're at sea level and they're doing really hard workouts, mainly lactate threshold, 85% maximum heart rate and above. So they're doing lactate threshold sessions, they're doing tempo runs, they're doing VO2 max intervals, uh, really high intensity, 90 to 95 to even 97%. And they tested these uh, athletes after a while of doing that intermittent training and it was only like an hour and a half uh, twice a week where they're hooked up to these masks the rest of the time they're uh, you know just walking around at sea level sleeping at sea level too um, they found that there was a measurable increase in their time to exhaustions tests on the treadmill as well as their ability to, to run like a 5k type of performance and so that shows that even having targeted little bouts of less oxygen doing high intensity workouts and they also had you know recovery days in between these lactate threshold and VO2 max interval sessions uh, they found that that was actually pretty effective and that's really the way to go and similar studies even show that um, there's been a lot of studies actually with the high low training thing where the idea is you sleep up high on a mountain uh, spend eight to ten hours up there most of the day and then uh, you come down low maybe you come down several thousand feet um, to train on, on a track and do a hard workout and you're able to run a lot faster because you're at closer to sea level obviously but then you go back up and you're sleeping high again so it's the whole high low principle and I knew uh, just coming from Oregon growing up uh, Galen Rupp and Alberto Salazar was coaching him out there and they had the this Nike project uh, they still have it actually but they had this whole pressurized house and it was great because they could go there play video games all day sleep in this house they'd put it up to 12,000 feet or whatever and then they'd walk out the door and they're in Portland, Oregon at close to sea level basically and they'd go tear up the trails or the track. Um, but I think, and, and the same thing is, is what I kind of have here in Boulder and I think the important thing with the whole high-low principle is to cycle it and you have to have this change where you structure your training and you, you structure your bouts of, of high altitude uh, living or running with with lower altitude stuff and obviously like I moved to Boulder because, well, one, because of the good beer, good beer, good people, good food, um, good sunshine, good trails, but also because of the altitude. And it's not because it's at an ideal altitude. It's a little low uh, for my liking, personally. I'd rather be closer to six or 7,000 feet, but 5,200 feet is not bad. And in the summer, when Sandy and I go camping and go on adventures, I could camp out, we could camp out at Leadville for five days at a time and go up from 10,000 feet to 14,000 feet. And um, I think it's it's good to, to change and have that mix because it causes uh, stimulus in your body. Uh, we're looking at, mainly the parameters they look at in studies is does it stimulate uh, your body's natural EPO production? Does it stimulate red blood cell count density and things like that? And uh, does it help with your VO2 max when you're actually tested in a 5K type of race? And those results actually are very, con it, there's and so with those results um, from the studies, you, there really wasn't anything that was real cut and dry. A uh, lot of variables being thrown around, but they did generally show that the high-low athletes had at least a 1% improvement in these 5K times in this one study that I saw. And it wasn't because necessarily they had a better red blood cell count um, or they actually had a higher VO2 max, but they're able to be more efficient and it happens at the cellular level. So. Um, very complicated biological, biochemical processes that may be going on there. Um, but what I will say is when I lived, uh, personal story, uh, when, I, when Sandy and I lived up at uh, Nederland, we were up at 8,600 feet. This was uh, last two summers ago. And after three months of living up at 8,600 feet and doing a lot of runs in the 10,000 foot, 11,000, 12,000 foot range, but also coming down to Boulder for 5,000 foot, uh, elevation workouts, 
I get my blood tested a lot and my hematocrit was the highest it has ever been. And that's basically the concentration of red blood cells uh, in your blood volume. So I had the highest density of red blood cells that I've ever had. So with that training stint, I was very well prepared for a race like Speed Goat, Sky Running Race, uh, that goes up to 12,000 feet and very well prepared this year for Pikes Peak Ascent uh, by training on the mountain at 14,000 feet. But, you know, you do the best with the environment you have and whether you want to invest thousands of dollars in an altitude tent or altitude chamber, um, that might be a little drastic. I think for most people, uh, optimizing your training, optimizing your workout schedule and your increasing your mileage up to a point where you can still be healthy is probably going to give you the most gains because uh, with the altitude training you generally from the studies at least that I read we're talking about a one or two percent type of difference uh, which could really add up uh, if you're depending on what time range you're in but uh, for for most people I think that it is kind of just another avenue to, to improve their performance and obviously if you're going to go climb Everest or a high mountain it might be advantageous to sleep in a tent and get get ready for that but uh, in terms of athletic performance from running, uh, plain hard work really, I think, gets you the, the longest way. And I haven't cycled my altitude training that much, even living up here in Boulder, or even taking advantage of it maybe as much as I could, but I'm also not as worried about it as much because I think it, it probably helps your performance more at shorter distance events from 1500 meters to 10k and half marathon. Um, you start running marathons and ultra marathons and above and usually your VO2 max doesn't really matter quite as much. Um, so, but it, you know, if you do the level 100, altitude sickness is a big issue there and people who are maladjusted to the altitude really suffer. Um, so that's kind of my rant and uh, opinions, but also research that I did on altitude training and altitude masks and other altitude simulation uh, type of devices or equipment. Um, thanks again for bringing up this topic and thanks for all the comments and subscriptions and views. I really appreciate all your support and I hope your 2015 is off to a great start. Uh, feel free to comment below with future training talk topics and be sure to vote and uh, share and like uh, this video if you if you liked it, and uh, I think that's a pretty long rant, but uh, thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions.